This morning I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And the whole chapter is, is, a, is a vital chapter. We're not going to take the time to read it all, but I hope that you'll do that in your leisure and in your, your devotion time, your prayer time. Take the time to read the whole chapter. And I'll tell you how important it is. You, you love 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, amen? And this is Paul's introduction. The 12th chapter is the introduction to chapter 13. When he talks about the greatest gift of all is the love that we have. That our lives are, our lives are, are designed by God. We have gifts of all kinds given to us. Everybody has a different gift. But one gift we all have, if we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, one gift that we all have is the gift of love. And God tells us to share that gift. So that's why chapter 12 is so important. And we're going to get into that. And I'm going to share with you some things that uh, I believe God would have us to hear and know at this particular time. Uh, he begins chapter 12 with the statement, now, concerning spiritual gifts. So everything that comes after that is related to our spiritual gifts. So look down at, at uh, verse 4. He says, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So Paul is telling you, whether you know it or not, you have a spiritual gift. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have a spiritual gift. God has given that gift to you. He has empowered you to use that gift. And so it would behoove you to know what your spiritual gift or gifts are and find a way to employ them in, to the benefit of God and to the benefit of his people. Then he goes on to say, verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. The Spirit manifestation is the gift he's talking about. To each one of you is given for the common good. It is not your gift alone. It is for all. It is for the fellowship. It is for the church. It is for the kingdom work. Verse 8, for to one is given through the for to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles uh, uh, to another prophecy to another the ability to distinguish that's discernment to some you have discernment between spirits the good spirits of God, the Holy Spirit, and, and those that would convince you to try to do otherwise. And to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. And Pastor Jim spoke on that last week. And then verse 11, all these, he says, are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. God has given you, for the common good, your own particular gift. And we're all gifted in different ways. Some, are you, some of you are good looking and some of you look like me. <laughs> but we can still work together, amen? amen. I, I give you something to uh, frown about. And these, these gifts, though they're all different, are to be used together as little Nemo <laughs> was able to pull them all together and get the job done. 
And that's what we are to do as well. When I became a Christian many, many years ago, but I remember that date and that day uh, so vividly in my mind. When I became a Christian, God instantly did some marvelous, life-changing things for me. I didn't understand it all at that time. I didn't know all that was taking place. At that moment, I just knew that I'd given my heart to the Lord. And I hope you have that memory in your mind as well. But when we gave our heart to the Lord, even if we didn't understand it, God made some changes. First of all, he gave me salvation, and that's all I really understood that salvation into, into his kingdom. Uh, he, besides that, he, he uh, instantly filled me with his Holy Spirit. Third, I became part of a new kingdom. And fourth, I was adopted into a new family. And I said, I didn't, as I said, I didn't understand all of this, not at all. But over the years, the Holy Spirit has revealed more and more to me and allowed me to understand better these blessed truths. Now, the Scripture is full of life-evolving revelation. It is, it is, it is so important to know that, that no matter what gift God has given us, it is, it, is a, it is a challenge for us to learn to use that gift as well. One of my spiritual gifts is the gift of administration. But I had to learn how to do administration. The gift was an inclination. The gift was my desire. The gift was where I felt comfortable. God had given me that gift. And as he gave me that gift, he also challenged me to become the best administrator that I could become. And so I went to school to learn how to be better at administrating the activities and the ministries of a church. God is asking us to take our gifts and through his word learn how to use them. Through training opportunities learn how to use them. Now in Ephesians 2 the apostle Paul says it this way. In verse 13 of Ephesians 2 he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Our salvation, he says, brought us into a close relationship with the Lord, a close relationship with our God, the Holy Spirit. We are close to God as I am as close to you. God is not somewhere off in the distance. I don't know about you, but there were times when I used to pray to God, I'd look up into the heavens and think, God, you're way up there somewhere and I can't see you. You're out of my sight. But the truth is, God is as close to me as I am to myself. For he is in me, filling me, he is around me, protecting me, guiding me. And so when I pray to God now, I like to pray like he's right here at my side and I'm just talking to him face to face like I'm talking to you. He gave us that privilege. We ought to use it. Amen? In verse 18 he says, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now what's he saying here? He's saying that because of what Jesus did in paying for our sins, he gave us direct access to God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not only is God here at my side, I have access to him. You don't have to come to Pastor Larry to have access to God. You don't have to come to Pastor Jim or Pastor Gary or to Denver or to any of us. You don't have to come to us and, and get our permission or our use us as an avenue to get to God. If you know him as Lord and Savior, he is as close to you right now 
as you are to yourself. Access to God through the Holy Spirit. That's his work. And so he hears your prayers. He answers your prayers. Verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Now saints and members are saying the same thing in two different ways. For we are all saints if we know God as Lord and Savior. Saints means those set aside for his purpose. You belong to a new family, the family of God. And as Paul puts it, you are a citizen and a member of the household. Now with citizenship, we have many privileges. But those privileges come with responsibility. In verse 22, to him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for the Spirit, or for God by the Spirit. And so here Paul is reminding us that we are being built up together. And the emphasis is on together. So that we can become better equipped to carry out the responsibilities that God has given us all. We need to all get together and swim down at the same time in unison. And when we do that, we can achieve what God has given us to achieve. As citizens of this great country, and it is a great country, amen? amen. Got a lot of kinks in it, a lot of warts on it, but it's the greatest country in the world. And I'm thrilled to be a citizen of this country. And as, that, as a citizen of this country, I have certain privileges. I can live and work where I choose. I can walk around in relative freedom because, because we have a great military and a great law enforcement group that help protect me and keeps me safe. And I have that privilege of, of doing that. There are some countries that I used to go to that I won't step in right now. I mean, I'd, I'd love to, to go see some other countries, but I tell you, some of them just aren't safe, and I don't want to be there. But here, we are, we are safe. We are, we are uh, protected by our Constitution if we, if we are ever accused of some wrong. Or, or if our rights are taken away from us. We, we, we have the right to, to uh, uh, elect our own leadership our, and the people who are governing us. It's great to be able to do that. And there, there are very few countries in our world where all of those privileges are ours. But folks, those privileges come with responsibility. I may not like them all, but there's a responsibility. We have to pay our taxes. No groans. <laughs> In fact, sometime this week, I have to go down to the court or to the county offices and pay the taxes on my house. I, I'm looking for volunteers <laughs> to, to help me. But we, we have those privileges, but we also have responsibility. We have the responsibility not only to be protected by our military, but some of us need to serve in the military, and, and many of you have. Uh, we have the responsibility to, that goes with the privilege of leading, electing our own people. We have the responsibility to elect them. We have the responsibility to vote. We have the responsibility not to go by what they tell you on the television or in the papers, but we need to research and find out who's best for, for what God wants done in our world, and then we need to go and vote, not because somebody else told us how, but because we researched and we know what's going on. Do you realize the small percentage of people in the U.S. that go to vote? And, and I tell you, there's fewer people voting than there are complaining. 
a lot of people complain, never cast a vote. Okay, we have the privileges, but we also have the responsibility. Now, in the same way, when we chose to follow Jesus, we automatically became citizens of his kingdom, and that citizenship requires responsibility. We get the privilege of being encouraged. We get the privilege of, of, being, of growing in our faith, but those privileges mean that we have to participate in the life of the body. You know, it's, it's great to be a part of the orchard. It's a great, one of the greatest churches I've ever been a part of. And, and it's exciting to be here, what God is doing and what he has done. But what he has done is not because of who stands up here preaching, it's because of how we work together to make things happen for the Lord and how we, how we work as a fellowship. We have that responsibility to find our place and serve the Lord with gladness, serve him with everything that we have. We need to, we need to participate in the life of the body. We need to submit to the leadership. We need to provide financial resources that are needed to maintain and advance the kingdom work. And we need to find our place of service and serve in the fellowship of the church. We all need to do that. That's part of the responsibility. God never created Christians to be foreigners and aliens in his kingdom. We are citizens. And the manifestation of his kingdom here on earth, the church. We are on earth. The church is the kingdom of God. It's that over which God rules. It's the people, not the buildings, not, to, not the, the constitution of the church, not the bylaws. It's the people. We are the church. And we are God's picture of the kingdom of God here on earth. I'll tell you how great it is to be part of that new family. John 3, 1 John 3, 1 says in the NIV, How great is the love of the Father, the, the love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. I like the way that translation says it. Being a part of this wonderful church prompts us to serve God being a part of his great kingdom, being a part of the blessings he gives prompts us to serve God. And, and, um, and that's what we want to do. He calls us to his side and he calls us to his service. God, through the Holy Spirit, is busy calling his people. And that's the first blank you have on your page there. Called. He's called us. It's not, it's not me calling you. It's God calling you. God has challenged you. God has offered you the opportunity. His call is coming and his call is constant. And there's no on and off switch here. In the New Testament Greek, uh, th th this, this word calling is in what we call the present tense and what that means is that he just keeps on calling his call never ceases he doesn't call you to serve for a week call you to serve for a month and take a six months vacation he calls his calling is constant he is reaching out to us every moment of every day calling us to be a part of his kingdom work he called Abraham, and he called Isaac, and he called Samuel, and Noah, and, and Joshua, and Joseph. He called Abraham from Ere the Chaldees, and he, he, it took much more than a, a commitment for Abraham to leave that great, wonderful land of the Chaldeans. In that particular time, it was a place that that just had so plenty, it was so, so great that it was highly populated and, and God wanted to get Abraham out of there and take him to the promised land of Israel. 
Abraham had never seen the promised land. He didn't know what it looked like. And so to pick up his family and move them from a, a, an area that was lush and plush and, and he had gathered many cr uh, uh, cattle and it just, he was just a, a, a well-to-do man at that time. And God says, Abraham, I want you to leave all of this and, and take what you can with you and go down here to this land that I'm going to give you. Now that's like telling you to leave L.A. and go to New York and you've never been to New York. Or to go someplace that you've never seen. It's like dropping you off in the middle of the Mojave Desert and telling you, fend for yourself. And yet Abraham went. He made a commitment to go. But I tell you that he didn't make that commitment until first he had surrendered to the Lord. Let me tell you, we, I, we need to look at the difference between commitment and surrender. According to the dictionary, the word commitment suggests certain things. First of all, it suggests responsibility. To be committed is to take up your time, offer your energy, uh, to, to sense an obligation. To be committed suggests loyalty, a devotion, or a dedication to a cause or to a person. But surrender is different than that. Surrender is so much deeper. Surrender has a broader meaning. Surrender is to declare yourself defeated. When you surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, you were in essence saying to God, I surrender myself to you. God, you won. You see, God, you and I have been in battle because I haven't known you, I've been your enemy. But now, Lord, you have won. I no longer want to be your enemy. I want to be your defeated person, your slave. And surrender means just that. We are a defeated people. But it can also suggest a strong emotion. The, the giving up of a possession or, or the control of something. And when we give up, when we give up, when we raise our hands, we give up control of all that we have. God, I surrender to you. I don't want to be your enemy. I give up everything I've got. You can have it. And then that strong emotion is that God... I have fallen deeply in love with you. You see, and I contend that there will never be commitment in our life until there is first true surrender. You see, there are a lot of people who claim to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I do not doubt that. But they have not surrendered all those little things that they call so important to themselves. They're still holding on to their time, still holding on to their money, still holding on to their precious possessions, still holding on to their selfishness. Mine, mine mine and I tell you until you declare yourself defeated until you give up possession and control of, of what belongs to you uh, and uh, yielding to that strong emotion and then finally abandoning one's rights to something you have we have to Lord it's not mine it's yours We've been fighting with him as an enemy, rejecting his rule over our life. Spiritually, we, are, we need to declare, God, I am defeated at, the, at your hands, 
and, and I am yielding authority to God over my life, and I give up any enmity with you. God, whatever you want, you can have. He's calling. Surrender. I give up my, you, I, I, Lord, I surrender. I give up control. I relinquish control of all my possessions. Commitment to anything, as I said, will never happen until we first surrender our selfishness. There will be no commitment to family, no commitment to our spouse, no commitment to our children, no commitment to our friends, no commitment to our church family, no commitment to our God will happen unless we are willing to surrender our life. Paul says it this way, for me to die is gain. His absolute devotion to a supreme personality gave him his reason for living. Christ gives us something for which we need to live, something of which we need never be ashamed of in honoring him. You know, it is, it is not popular to be Christian in our nation today. There are people that frown on you Young people are told they can, some of our school districts, they can't wear their cross around their neck. They can't wear a Jesus patch on their jersey. They can't pray at the flagpole or anywhere else. Now we're fighting back and pushing back on those things, but, but they're trying to stop it. You see, they're, they're, trying, they're trying to get God out of our nation because the secular society feels uncomfortable in the presence of God. So let's erase him. The only trouble is we can't erase him. That's their problem, not mine. <laughs> they cannot keep me from praying. Do you realize that Religion is a religion is a a system of beliefs. It's a belief system. It's believing in God or believing in whatever, because not all religions believe in God. There there are different kinds of religions, but they're all religions. And I tell you that atheism, by the same definition, is a religion. It is a belief system. And so if we, if we take God out of the nation, we take him out of our courthouses, take him out of our, our government buildings, all we've done is yield to the religion of atheism. You see, there is no neutral ground when it comes to a relationship with God. There's no middle point. There's no spot that you can go to because God is everywhere and he keeps calling he keeps calling people to him calling him to service well God continues to call us to his service from the cross of Calvary he called us without, without his call of salvation you would never have known him you know you can't just decide one day I'm going to be a Christian You'll never decide until God calls you, till he sends you an invitation. You see, the relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. And God has to reach out to you, but he does. But when he does, at that point, we need to answer his call. And after he came into our lives, he sent us the comforter, the, the paraclete. The, the Greek word is, which means another, 
of the same kind, one who stands alongside. The Holy Spirit, is, as he's called a paraclete, the Holy Spirit is one just like Jesus. He is Jesus. He is God. In Galatians 1, Paul wrote that God set him aside in his mother's womb. In other words, Paul said, he had a purpose for me from the very beginning. And he called him through his grace, that Damascus Road event. God came to, to, uh, to uh, Paul. And the reason, the purpose was that to, it would re, he was to reveal his son through the preaching of the Gentiles. Now the call has to be answered. If, if, if you're going to have the grace of God on you, you have to answer his call. You have to open yourself up to do what God wants done. Otherwise, you, you miss all the blessings of grace. You can't do it without that. He didn't have to make salvation available to us. He didn't have to invite us to his table. He didn't have to offer us our purpose in life. But he did. And now it's up to each of us, as it was to Paul, that, that when his Holy Spirit comes, come, continues to call, when he calls us to kingdom building, to life changes, events uh, in us and others, and he calls us to serve, and, and we're saved to serve, to serve Jesus with our heart, our soul, and our mind. It is the calling that gives purpose to our life. God has called you to his kingdom work, and it behooves you to find out where he has called you and find your place of service. In John chapter 12, he says, If any man serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now the antithesis of that is, if you don't follow and you don't serve, God doesn't honor. But he says it in the positive. Colossians says this, Wherever you go, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And so he calls us to his service. But now we come to the second point in the outline. He equips us, or he gifts, he gifted us. I'm getting ahead of myself. But that's equipment. He, he equipped, equipped us. He gifted us. Uh, what he says when he uh, says to each of us, he talks about the manifestation of the Spirit in, in, in verses uh, 1 through 11. And he begins by saying, now concerning the spiritual gifts, what he's talking about is that God has gifted every one of us. Look at that key passage. Paul says he wants to be clearly understood. There is a variety of gifts, but all those gifts from, come from the Holy Spirit. And no one ever, while speaking of the Spirit, he says, can say it didn't come from God because, because God's Spirit will not lead you into those things that displease God. I've had over the years people tell me so many times, well, I believe God has asked me to do such and such. And I said, you know, that's contrary to his word. I know, but God says I ought to do it. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't set you up for failure. He doesn't want you to be the Humpty Dumpty on the wall. He has gifted you and Part of that gift is the Spirit leading you. These gifts you possess, however, are not your own. They are the Lord's and they are to 
be used to glorify him. There are a variety of activities that you can be involved in. There are a, a variety of ministries that you can be, be a, a part of. There are a, a, a lot of activities that you can get involved in doing it for the Lord. That is God's purpose for your life. We're gifted through the individual gifts as a church. We are gifted through the individual gifts of, individual gifts of the people. Do you know that we have all the Sunday school teachers we need? They're out there. We just need some of them to surrender. We have all the counselors we need. That's why Pastor Jim spends about half his time all week long talking to people. We have all the counselors we need. They're sitting out there. We have all the money we need. You know, God has all the money in the world and it's in the pockets of his people. We have all the money we need. Why is it now... This percentage is much better at the orchard, but nationally, the, the percentage is 20% of the people do 80% of the work at church. Why is that? We have all the people. We have everything we need. If we needed to paint this auditorium, I bet there's some people out there that could throw a paintbrush around. We have it all. God has equipped this church right now the way he wants it. He has given us all the gifts, all the talents, all the skills, everything that we need at this moment are a part of the fellowship of these people called the Orchard. He's built us just the way he wants us. He's designed us, he's structured us, and he's called us. He's gifted us. We need to hear his call. Everyone who knows Jesus as Lord has been given particular gifts, talents, skills. And if used, will bring an outpouring of his grace upon the orchard as a whole, but especially an outpouring of his grace upon those who are letting him have their life. God blesses us through our relationships with people. He does, it's not a great big house that blesses you. It's not a Mercedes Benz that blesses you. My, my, my house, we're, we're really messed up, man. We have two cars, a Lincoln and a Honda. I mean, we can't decide which way we ought to go. <laughs> but it's not that, that, that's not where the blessings are. The blessings come from service. He has given you a gift. And when you use that gift to answer his call to employ, to employ, that, and to employ that gift, you will have all the joy God wants you to have. Of course, you need to discover what that gift is and you need to expect God's blessing. But it comes through serving people. My greatest joys in ministry have come from the many men and women that I've known down through the years. I find no joy in raising huge sums of money except that it provides opportunity to touch lives. I find no pride in buildings except that they serve the base of ministry to reach people. Let me tell you about a couple. A young man, Billy, grew up with my kids a long time ago in one of my churches. Billy was a quiet, you know, type of guy. Wasn't necessarily the leader, but he was in the mix and, you know, people liked him. 
But Billy was different than everybody else. Billy had a deep hunger for God. And God called Billy into the music ministry. He went off to seminary, college, and then seminary, and he went on and got a Ph.D. in, in music. And, and Billy is now serving one of the largest churches as administrator in the Sacramento area. He has written a number of, of presentations, music and, and, and drama scores and what have you. Thousands of people have watched him. Every time he puts on one of his programs, they, they, they have a, uh, a presentation every night for two weeks in their church and they fill it up every night. That's Billy. <laughs> I could talk to you about about two girls, Debbie and Ginger. These two girls were exceptional pianists. They were concert pianists. What they chose, rather than go on the concert, the big musical circuits, they chose to serve the Lord by playing music in his church on a full-time basis. They were there. Every time there had to be music played, they were there. I could tell you about Steve. Now, Steve is a kid I'd like to have killed if God would have let me. <laughs> you know those kind? He tried to date my daughter. <laughs> and I told him no. <laughs> Steve today serves as a missionary in one of the toughest areas of Southeast Asia. Giving his heart to the Lord. Folks, that's my joy. And I could have embarrassed a few of you out there today by telling you that you're my joy as well. Because of your faithful service to God, you have answered the call, you are using your gifts and he is blessing your life. That's where the joy is. The joy isn't living in a 5,000 square foot house. The joy isn't driving a Lincoln Capri. The joy isn't traveling all over the world. The joy isn't having a huge bank account. The joy we have is the relationship we have with God and his people. And if you want joy in your life, put your life to work. Find a place to serve God where you can share his word and share his love. There has to be, if you want joy, if you want the same kind of blessings I have, they need, there needs to be a time that you are willing to surrender and then make a commitment and employ your gift in growing others. You need to make a difference. Now, if you want to be blessed, answer the call. Commit your life. Make his call to you a lifetime work. And then you'll be able to look back someday when you're old like me. That was the joke. <laughs> Somebody said the other day, you're getting older. I said, praise God. I don't want to stop getting older, but I'm not going to act my age. Now, our service to God will be in relationship to how we measure his service to us. Ladies, you know that when your husband treats you nice, you just want to love all over him. But if he ignores you, you watch TV in the other room. Because you're not interested in football when the soaps are on, right? Teachers called of God to teach ought to see their ministry as ongoing. It ought to become their life passion. If God has called you to teach, you ought to be teaching. 
and not on a part-time basis. You need to make it your life work. You need, you need to have a passion for reaching children for the Lord. Find your passion and do the very best for Jesus full-time, not part-time. The apostle uses an analogy of the the physical body here in our passage of Scripture, if you read down. He talks about the body being fitly joined together and, you know, all the parts are connected. you got two hands and two feet and two eyes, you know, and, and he says, well, the body needs all of these parts. And I tell you, folks, sometimes if one part isn't working right, the whole body hurts, amen? It's like my car. It wouldn't run. I checked the engine, I checked it had gas, it had oil, the battery was charged up. I mean, everything looked fine to me, but it wouldn't run. And you know what was wrong with it? A little fuse. Just one little tiny part stopped the whole thing from working like it ought to work. It was still a car. It still had four doors and a windshield, four tires on it. Man, it looked like a car. The other word for car is automobile. There was nothing automatic and it wasn't mobile. And it's the same thing with the church. The church is called as a unit. Everyone gifted like they need to be gifted, just like God designed it, just like God set it up. Everyone called. And those parts need to be functioning or the whole body is impaired. And I want, to know, I want you to know, folks, if you have an arm, hold it up in the air. Now tell me a time that you want to say to this arm, I don't need you. Take a rest. You see, we expect every piece to work, right? We expect, we expect every part of this body to function like it ought to function. And if, if it's not, then we're in trouble. Every part of the healthy body, or in our case, the healthy church, must function on a continual basis. We don't have a part-time kidney, a part-time heart. It's got to beat all the time. And as Paul talks about the body, the parts of the church ought to beat all the time. Any part that takes temporary leave lessens the effect of the whole. A leg must continue to do leg work. The arm must continue to do arm work. The eye has to function on a full-time basis for, all of the, for the good of the whole. In Acts 5.40, the disciples were instructed by religious leaders to stop their preaching. You remember that? Right after Pentecost, they came to him and said, you guys got to stop your preaching. Did they stop? No. Because their passion was to get the word of God out into the world. For the same reason, Isaiah wrote these words. In Isaiah 6, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. 
Isaiah had seen the Lord and he became aware of his sin. He became aware of, of the fact that he was at enmity with God. And as he reflected upon his relationship with God, the seraphim came and touched his lips saying, God has forgiven you. He's wiped away all your sins. He's, he's, he's taken over control of your life and your heart. And what did, what did Isaiah end up saying? Then, the Lord, then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell the people. Called by God, gifted by God to tell the people. That brings us to the third part of our message and the word is empowers. Acts 1.8 tells us that we have power to do what God has instructed us to do. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And if you know God, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Amen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He has empowered us to do what he's called us to do. The power is for service, to be a witness to the world of the love God has for humanity, his crown creation. The power is for service, to walk in authority in his name. And we don't need to walk around with our heads low in this, in this world that, 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 tries to suppress who we are. We don't need to cower from the attacks of Satan's angry mob. We can, with his authority, resist against all sorts of attacks. We are to be in his service, to walk in the authority of his name. Why are you doing this? Because God told me to do it. And I have a choice to serve man or to serve God. But I choose to serve God. The power is for serving, to worship in his name. He said that if you would not praise him, even the rocks would cry out in praise of God. The power is for service, to teach them what I have taught you, he says. And one of the greatest outreach tools we have for our Lord is to teach, to teach our children in the home, in the church, teach them of God's love, teach them to love one another, teach them to rely on God, to have faith, teach them to humble themselves in order to serve one another. And we teach them not by words, but by example. Because you see, when Abraham made his surrender and his commitment to God, it affected the lives of all of those who followed him for generations. I don't know what your family life was like when you were growing up, but let's make it different if we need to for the family life of our children. Let's serve God with high, mind, heart, body, and soul. What are your passions? What captures most of your free time? What is it that excites you, causes your heart to pound, your blood to race, your spirit to soar? What's your passion? Nothing will move you from potential to productive until you are moved from passive to passion. Get a passion for something. Jeremiah's passion. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in. I cannot, he said. I cannot hold it in. It's my passion. Nehemiah's passion. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm going, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And you remember the, 
the two friends of his, Sanballat and Geshem, didn't want him to do all of this building back up the walls of Jerusalem. And so they said, Nehemiah, come down here. We want to talk to you. And Nehemiah knew what they were after, and he, so he said, send him a message back. He says, I've got time for you. What I've got going here is more important. This is my passion. Paul's passion in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death. The passion of God. Passion for God. What's your passion? Pray with me. Thank you.